Better System Trader, Episode 21. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome to the Better System Trader Podcast. This is episode 21, and I'm your host, Andrew Swanscott. This week's guest is a proprietary trader trading his own money with more than 100 automated systems across 25 different futures contracts. In 2008, he won first place in the World Cup Trading Championship for the E-Minis. In 2010, he placed third in the World Cup Trading Championship, and then in 2011, he won taking out first prize. He was also the founder of a CTA and a brokerage firm, but he's given all that away just to focus on trading his own money instead. His name is Tim Ray. He trades fairly short term with most trades being completed within a one to three day time frame, and he's fairly active doing several thousand transactions a month across multiple clearing firms. In this week's episode, we discuss various aspects of trading multiple strategies, including monitoring performance, money management, correlation, technology and trading in markets and are not in your time zone. He also has a really interesting story about the impact of the PFG collapse, which saw him take some pretty heavy losses. He openly discusses the impacts it had on him and his trading and how he worked his way through it. It was a really tough time for a lot of traders and there is a good lesson in there for all of us, so listen out for that. But just before we do get started, a very quick announcement. To celebrate the milestone of releasing episode 20 of the podcast last week, we organise a huge book giveaway where you can win an entire year's worth of trading books plus loads of other prizes. Listen out for more details at the end of this episode or if you just can't wait, go to the show notes page at bettersystemtrader.com slash 21 and you'll find more info there. All right, let's get to it. I hope you enjoy this week's chat with Tim Ray. Thanks for joining us today, Tim. Now, you've had quite an interesting trading journey, so let's start at the beginning with how you got into trading. Um, well, I had dabbled a little bit. Um, well, it goes right back to as a child, actually. I had uh, My father bought me shares in Boeing Corporation, which he worked for at the time in the 60s. Um, I did also play around with some shares, buying and selling options and things like that. Um, but the real change came around about 2012 when I had, sold some substantial um, properties. I had a car business and um, farming and so forth. And so I had sold down a lot of stuff and I took time out um, to decide what I wanted to do next. And trading was something that had always kind of fascinated me. And so um, I sort of set out to um, to learn a bit more about it because I knew I didn't know how to trade. And that's kind of where I, I started uh, because I had the time and the financial resources to kind of now, I guess, try and seriously pursue this, you know. Okay, and then what type of style of trading did you start out doing back then? Um, started out, well, I started out, you know, originally it was just all discretional. Um, I was probably trying to catch falling knives. Um, <laughs> but when I got into, you know, getting some training around trading and so forth, it again was still discretional based, um, probably more trades that would last a week or two sort of thing. And that's probably where I thought I would be as a trader. And that's kind of where I started. Um, yeah, that sort of swing trading, but probably you know, more like a week or two sort of thing. You know, that's how I started. That's certainly not where I'm not now, but that's where I started. Okay, so how did you go with discretionary trading and did you continue doing that particular style? Well, I, in some ways I did all right considering what I knew, but um, I used to struggle. I'd, I'd been to a number of different courses and things and read books and so forth, but one of the things I used to really struggle with was um, you get taught a method. Like let's just take something Let's like a breakout, for example, classic breakout. Everybody knows what it is. They can show you support and resistance, and you get in here. And and the, at the time, a particular school that had done some training I'd been to um, used to send out trade alerts. And they'd say, look, there's a trade alert. You know, something's happening here with the euro, whatever it is. And and then, of course, three days later, there would be a big move. And they'd say, oh, look, you know, look what happened here. And it was a no-brainer. And I used to get really annoyed because... They never told you exactly where to enter, exactly how to manage that trade. But it was really obvious in hindsight that, you know, there was a big move. In fact, even before that, it was probably obvious there was going to be a big move. But how to manage that was another matter. And so I thought, well, look, 
surely if the methods that uh, they're showing us, if there actually are valid methods, then surely we can be more precise about how we do this and right. rather than using our discretion. And then inevitably what would happen is you'd beat yourself up after it because, oh, you know, why did I put my entry there? Why did I put my stop there? Or why did I, you know, so uh, I thought there's got to be a better way than this. So why not use, you know, a systematic approach? That's kind of um, how when I moved away from discretionary then, basically. Okay, and how did you get started in the systematic approach? Uh, well, it probably sounds really funny. The early days was quite crazy, really. Um, I found a guy that had developed a system, and it seemed to have a literal, an audible alert over your computer, and I had to try and stay awake all night to or, or wake up when this thing made this noise and trade. And, uh, you know, it was just it was in that nightmare. Uh, but I moved quickly into... Um, looking at different platforms and different things you could use to have systems in. And I started initially by saying, well, look, you know, I, I stumbled across something called TradeStation, which I keep hearing people talk about, can I trade directly from my TradeStation? I don't know why I'd never struck it, but I hadn't. I, and I came across it. And so I started to work with TradeStation. And I, and I thought, well, it has a lot of tools already in it. And I thought, well, maybe I can build a system and so I started using trying to build systems using sort of typical indicators and things like that. Um, and then I realized after a little while, well, hang on, I'm trying to reinvent the wheel here. <laughs> so, you know, there's probably people that have gone before me that have already done this a lot better than me. And so that set me down on a course of kind of trying to find commercially available stuff. And some of it I just got black boxed and I leased it or bought it. And then eventually later I did um, buy some stuff with open code. And that's where I really started then into the serious system development because I started working with the algorithms rather than just um, the, the, the um, sort of straight tools that were in the box, if you know what I mean. Yeah, sure. So during that time where you were searching, um, was there anyone in particular or anything in particular that really pushed you forward quite quickly? Um, I, there are a number of things probably. Um, one of the things um, was in the training school that I had been involved with, there was a trader and he had a little fund and um, he was doing quite well. And so you could only trade with him if you'd been, you know, gone to this training school and so forth. And so I put some money with him and he turned out to be just a crook. I mean, he wasn't initially, I don't think, but he ended up, there was, I think there was a hundred of us or something like that in the thing. He had nearly $10 million in it. And um, he stole all the money in the end. Um, he admitted it. I talked to him afterwards and, you know, and so forth. But um, and I saw, I, I think that I also put money with a, it wasn't exactly a CDA, but he, he was a CDA, but he ran a trading program. And he, he took the account that I had, and within three months, I had to put money in it to close it because he, <laughs> he drove, <laughs> drove it to below zero. And I think those two things made me say to myself, look, I have, got to work out how to do this stuff for myself. I cannot rely on other people. Mm. And so that's what kind of was the driving force to figure it out. Is, is that was is that, was that your question? Yeah. So just before we get to your style of trading now, the few things have happened between uh, then and now. I understand you owned a, a brokerage firm and was also a CTA. So yeah. how did you get started in those? Well, I think um, the, the, the initial thing I did was, well, the first thing I did was a systems vendor. So I was developing systems. And after a while, I looked at some of the stuff I was working with, and I thought, you know, some of the stuff I've got here, I reckon was as good as, if not better than, some of the commercial stuff I'd seen out there. And so it sort of set me down a path, well, maybe I could also get an income stream out of what I've done, because I'm not going to trade, you know, the, the level of contracts with like the S&P, I'm not going to trade 500 contracts. So somebody else would be trading this as well, and I could be getting an income. That's where it started. And then I also looked at the CTA realm and realized there was the potential there to trade quite large amounts of money was there. So I sort of set off down that path as well. Um, and then the brokerage thing came about because um, so the broker, which is a broker that um, I work with, he actually joined me in my CTA as well. Um, as a principal, he had been seeing what I'm doing, and he, he, I'd always sort of thought, oh, I wouldn't mind having a brokerage, but I wouldn't want to run it myself. And so, mm. and he wanted to get out of the firm he was in and run his own one. So, I kind of put the money up. Basically, I didn't do the brokering work; he did all that. Um, it was run out of California. Still, still actually is going. I sold it, but um, 
but he was the part, he was like a he was the managing partner. I was a financial partner, if that makes sense, you know. You're now just trading your own funds. So, yeah. w- why did you leave the CTA or brokerage business? Um, there was a couple, three things. Uh, the, the first was I struggled with. I call it a moral dilemma. My accounts generally did relatively well on my overall trading. My overall results were relatively good. And yet my clients um, mostly lost money. Um, and the reason they lost money was there was a number of things. Some of it was the the, the fees they would pay. They would pay um, subscription fees or whatever it was. They also paid large brokerage fees. Like I pay, you know, I, I use, I get a discount rate. I get you know, deep discount fees. But the brokers were charging these clients a lot of brokerage. And so I would be making, on the same account, on the same system, I would make money and the customers would lose money. And so I struggled with that, kind of as a, I call it a moral dilemma. And I wasn't happy about it. Uh, and there's a lot to do when you're when you're trading for other people. It changes things, a lot of different responsibilities. And I had to have staff and all this sort of stuff. Um, but then a couple of things, other things happened. The first one was a firm called MF Global failed. They were the eighth biggest clearing firm in the world. And I lost a lot of the clients I'd had at that point because of the, you know, that firm, firm failed. And uh, so that was a knockback. And then in 2012, PFG, which which we then had a lot of clients with PFG, they failed. And um, there was a major fraud there. And so those there was a whole lot more clients wiped out and, and my own money as well. I lost the majority of my trading funds at that point. Um, and so that was just a time to really reassess things. And so it was a good catalyst to reassess things. And I never really, I, I guess I'd be struggling with this dilemma for a while. So in the end, I decided, no, I'm going to refocus on um, what I saw as my vision, what I saw as what I wanted to do, and just refocus on that and, and not continue with this customer stuff that I'd kind of been struggling with anyway, you know. Mm, okay. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll come back to that PFG um, yeah. uh, topic a little bit later. But uh, so let's talk about your trading today. Um, let's start with what, what style of trading do you do? What markets are you looking at? Well, I mean, over the years I've done a number of things, but these days, like for the past several years, um, I've traded futures. I did trade a lot of forex for a while, but now I'm entirely trading futures. And I trade. Oh, I'm not sure if it's about 25 different contracts, but basically I trade most things. So I'll trade the metals. I'll trade the energy contracts, the grain contracts, the the um, index markets, the treasuries, um, the meats, the softs. I'll trade pretty well most things. Mm. And um, I trade those with a kind of a wide range of techniques, um, but primarily short term. So a lot of day trading, some swing trading. Um, don't do a lot of trading that goes out a week or two. I do have some, but not a lot. So that's kind of the, 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 and so most of the trades are relatively short term. And so then I get a lot of activity. So there's, a, there's yeah, the, this time of day, there's not much going on, but you know, I do a lot of trades every day. You know. Yeah. Is there a particular reason why you go for shorter term rather than longer term? Uh, the reason is basically a couple of things. Uh, I just seem to have found things that work for me um, in the shorter term you know, than I have on the longer term. The other thing is from a confidence perspective, let's say you develop a system and it's got, uh, one trade a, a, a week, well, that's quite a bit, but I suppose it wouldn't be a short-term system. So let's say you got one trade a month. You've got 12 trades a year, five years, you've got roughly 50 trades. It's not a big amount of trades to be able to say, well, look, is that really a, actually a good method or is it just that it happened to work? And so when you've got a large sample pool, you can tend to be a bit more confident that there is something in that method. So say you, you take the other extreme, you've got a thousand trades now. Um, I get I'm more confident that if there's a thousand trades that that methods work for a thousand trades um, that I'm more confident than I am if it's only got 50 trades if that makes sense so some of it's confidence um, but just it's just something I've seemed to have found found works for me okay and when you're developing a, a strategy what type of uh, performance are you looking for well I mean there's a number of things you would look at but broadly speaking I would probably be aiming to see around 10 times this is on a historical back test um, and probably before sort of slippage commission sort of thing I would probably be aiming to see around about 10 times the profit than the worst drawdown on a five year period say for example um, but there's a number of things you're looking at you're looking at the, the longs and the shorts and um, 
you know, how frequent the drawdowns are and so forth. It's, it's kind of, there's a lot of, there's actually a lot to that. There's a number of things you would look at um, in that, the, the average trade size and things like that, you know, because you've got slippage and commission. So, so the real life is that, you know, it might look like you made $150 on a trade, but in reality, by the time you've, when you actually got where you actually got filled, you you, you never you didn't make that. You mm, know? Okay, so I understand that you trade quite a number of systems. Do you mind sharing how many systems you're currently trading? Well, as right today, I'm only trading about a hundred. I was trading um, closer to 150, um, but I've just gone through actually literally this last week a bit of a, a reassessment of some of the things that I'm doing, and I've I've, I've t- at this stage have paired it back to around about a hundred um, just right at the moment. Wow. So with so many strategies, how do you keep track of the individual performances? Well, the individual is quite easy. You, I've got, there are all these workspaces up where each one, each system's on a chart and the software I've got, you can simply put your mouse across it, you know, get the, look at a performance report, just click on it. And you can go from chart to chart to chart, looking at the, um, the results. And the easiest thing to do is just look at the equity curve. That's probably the easiest thing, but you can look deeper. Mm. So it really doesn't take that much to actually see how the systems are doing on an individual basis. I mean, it takes a few minutes with 100, obviously. I tend to look at every every day as a habit. I look at the back test on every system that's done a trade today. It's just a, just a personal habit. You know? Okay, and how do you determine when to drop one from your portfolio? That's, that's a really hard one um, because what I will say is um, when you develop a system, and let's just say you've got a system and it's got, uh, I've got a five-year back test and it's got... Um, a fifty thousand um, dollar profit and a five thousand dollar drawdown, so it fits in all the things. Realistically, I'm not going to get. I'm. I. I wouldn't say in the future at some point. I think I'm going to get greater than a five thousand dollar loss. If that, even if that system continues to work well, because I'm looking at a very finite period in time backwards, and I've got an, in, an infinite time going forward. Well, until I die, um, but I've also got. Um, the reality is that the past isn't the same as the future. It might be quite similar, but it won't be the same. So I won't expect the performance to be as good going forward on average than, than it was on a back test. So I don't want to throw a system out just because it's got a worse drawdown. That's, you know, because that, otherwise I might be throwing out good systems. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is a hard one. There's a number of things I look at. Um, sometimes you'll see deteriorating performance. Um, it is, yeah, it's a number, it's pretty hard to explain what it is. There's a number of things that you're, you're assessing and sometimes I guess you could, maybe it is intuition or gut feel to a certain extent. There is there is science behind it, but a lot of it is ultimately just a judgment call as to what you're going to take out and what you're not going to take, you know, what you're going to keep trading. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes you also see shifts in behavior. And for example, um, I trade the Euro US, I used to trade Euro US currency, now I trade currency futures and you'll see something like the like the euro, the volatility of that has gone down and down and down for quite a number of years. And so systems that were working well under a relatively volatile environment, when the volatility has gone down and down and down, don't maybe not work so well. And I guess the question is, is that volatility going to rise in that system and do well again, or, is, or are we just going to be in a lower volatility period? And so some, at some point you have to make a judgment call and with, in my case, I've got so many systems. It's not like I, you know, like, like I've got plenty of things to trade, so I don't have to trade something. You know? Yeah. Okay. And what about the opposite side of that? How do you know when to add a new strategy to your portfolio? Well, the adding of the new strategy to me is really around money management. So it's really to do with um, can my account handle another system, um, and if it can, and I've got a system I want to add in, then I'll add it in, um, and also balancing that too in terms of trying to keep a balance of um, you know, so that you haven't got all your systems are trading gold and none of them are trading S and P or soybeans or something. So trying to keep a, a a good balance in your portfolio, and also not just that, but day trading, swing trading, the size of the drawdowns, the where they did, you know, there's a number of things in there too. You know. Yeah, and I guess with uh, trading so many strategies, there can do you find that there's correlation between them, and if so, how do you manage that? Yeah, because, I mean, the trouble is, even though you might have a, a number of systems, some of them are looking for a very similar thing. So, it's like they said, there's many ways to skin a cat. There's many ways There's many ways to determine what a breakout is and how to manage it. And so you can have 10 systems that are all breakout systems. And so 
Uh, they're not going to be identical, but there may be some correlation between those. Um, and the, also, the other thing is you'll find markets go through phases. So, for example, um, you know, like I talked about the euro getting lower in volatility, or like this year, for example, I could say, you know, just on an observation point of view, gold's been all, been doing a lot of range bound stuff. So you got to 1200 and it just sort of was range bound around that 1200 mark. Then it got to 1100 and it was range bound around that 1100 mark. So, so you perhaps longer than normal periods in, 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 in that are range bound. And so when you get that, those systems don't tend to work so well. So gold as a, as a, group of systems may not perform as well as they have in the past. Um, so you'll see things like that. Yeah. Okay. And where do you get your ideas for all of these strategies? Oh, I get them anywhere I can find them, really. I mean, um, I mean I've mean, i been doing this for a long time. So I basically, if I find stuff that I can get, um, I'll collect it and sit on it. And I might look at it at the time. I might not. Um, there's also stuff out there. There's books, there's magazines, websites. Uh, I do a little bit of collaboration with other people and things like that. So, you know, there's myriads of ideas just out there. And um, so I, I use those as my initial starting concepts rather than sitting down with a blank piece of paper and saying, right, what's what's something I observe? Let's develop a system based on that. Mm. Uh, because it's like there's plenty of people that have gone before me. They're a lot smarter than me. And they're a lot better at maths than me. And so they've been able to to give me a, a, a what I would call a better starting point than me sitting down with a piece of paper and then trying to write that in the code. So I start with an existing concept, but I mean, even something simple like a breakout and their way of calculating a breakout and then, and then move forward from there. And I can try, then I can start adding to it my own things. I can say, well, what about trying this type of exit technique? And what if I make it a day trade system? And what if I use this stop? And so I can try all these different things. I can add a filter in or whatever, you know. Yeah, okay. And one, one final question on strategy development. So once you've come up with a strategy that you that you like and you're ready to trade, do you trade it straight away or do you wait a while? I would normally just turn it on the same day. I mean, I might wait. It, it, you know, and then the time's gone past. I probably would have hesitated and waited a week or two just to watch it to make sure there's no technical glitch or something weird I've, I've missed in it. Um, but with the number of systems that I trade now, I, I really don't have any hesitation. I say, look, if I'm satisfied with that, I could watch it for a month. That isn't going to tell me. I could watch it for three months. It ain't going to tell me anything. It's just going to tell me what it did. It isn't going to tell me what's going to continue to work. So if I'm satisfied with it, I'll just simply trade it. Um, and if I have made a mistake, if there is some glitch in the system or something I've missed, I can pick that up as I go along and then fix it. You know, For example, if I realized I hadn't, I don't know, hadn't got my stop quite right and it wasn't gonna, it was going to um, not hit the stop during certain hours or whatever it was I can fix that you know mm, okay all right well I think we'll move on to money management now I saw a presentation you made at the ATAA conference in Melbourne I think it was in uh, 2014 mm -hmm. um, you displayed a slide showing a thousand percent returns within two years so I assume you're using a pretty aggressive money management style there. Yeah. Can you share your money management principles or your approach to uh, risk management? Yeah, in general, actually, that, that was, I had a fairly, that was a, uh, that was pure, that was, you know, I know, remember what the count you're talking about. So that, in that particular instance, um, I um, had a policy of, you know, and I said, what's my money management? And therefore, what's my account? And and, I, and as I make money, uh, then I'll add, you know, you decide what your parameters are and it's, it's a bit hard to explain on the phone what they are. But if you say, well, I'm a, I'm, for every so many dollars in the account, I'm, I mean, let's keep it simple. Let's treat all systems equal and we'll say all the systems are equal in terms of their risk. Then for every certain amount, so many dollars, I can trade so many systems. So every time I've made a certain amount of money, I can add in more systems or more lot size. Likewise, is if I'm losing money, then I can decrease it. So it's like a compounding thing. So the best way I would say is if you take a calculator out and you say, well, what's if, you know, and again, this was a fairly aggressive account. So I was aiming for, uh, let's just, just say, lose, use a figure of 10% per month. If you say I had made 10% per month at the end of 12 months, if, if you didn't take any money out of that account you, and you compounded that, you did not make 120%, you actually made around um, 200 percent because of the power of of compounding and then if you do that for multiple years you will get um, an even more powerful effect you know so if you said oh, i tripled a 200 percent account 200 percent return would be tripling your account within 12 months okay so now you've got 
three times the money you started with. You do that again. Now you've got nine times the money. To, not nine times the money you started with. If that makes sense. Yeah. So do you um, do you use a similar risk management approach for all strategies, or do you modify them based on their uh, characteristics? Well, I try to. I mean, for the most part, because I use so many, and maybe it's a little bit of laziness. I I mostly just treat them all the same, and they aren't all the same. But it's also hard. It's a bit like saying how long is a piece of string. So I've got a system here. It's got a low stop loss, and it's a day trading system. Um, in, in maybe I'd say, well, maybe I could trade more lots of that per this other one here. That's that's got a big drawdown and, and so forth. But you don't know what the future is going to hold on any of those systems. So to a certain extent, I'll scale some of them. I'll say, oh, I'm going to trade two lots of that for every one of that. Or I do a little bit of that, but not much. And uh, yeah, so so I don't tend to do that. Just probably for simplicity, for, you know, a little, just a little bit. If I can say, look, here's a system that's only got a $250 stop loss, you can only trade once a day. It's only had a $2,500 drawdown in the last five years. Well, yeah, maybe I'll trade two lots of that or, or three lots of that compared to another system, you know. Mm, yeah. Um, and, but I probably should, to be fair, I probably should have done a little bit more of that. Mm. And what about the um, the risk across the entire portfolio? Do you, do you monitor that as well? Well, you know, you put that. Um, I'm working on the portfolio approach. And so with a portfolio approach, I'm a lot more aggressive than I would be if I was just trading an individual method. So because I'm trading a whole lot of methods, some are winning, some are losing all the time. And so what I get is a net effect. And because of that, um, I'm able to trade a lot more systems per dollar, if you want to call it that, or per whatever amount than I could if I was just trading one system. Um, and so I do take a relatively aggressive approach to that um, because, I don't know, I'm a greedy pig. I don't know. I just, uh, I, yeah, I mean, the, the purpose of this business is to try and um, make profit. And so um, it's, you've got to strike the balance between being, being too risk, you know, uh, uh, take too much risk and then blowing your account up. But also if you take so, so, so such a small risk, you'll also never make any money either, you know what I mean? So it's kind of trying to strike that balance. Yeah, and how do you find that balance between um, or what makes you uh, comfortable? Well, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, so I, I think I probably, for the most part, have found that. Um, and so I have a kind of a formula I use basically to say, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a simplistic formula, but it's a dollar-based formula. So I say for every so many dollars, I can trade so many systems or so per system or whatever it is. And I can just simply add or subtract according to my account um, with that. And I'm, I've got targets around, you know, where I'd like to see myself in terms of returns or in, in drawdowns. It doesn't always work like that. But for the most part, um, yeah, I've kind of found that happy medium. And, um, for example, what I would say, well, I'll give, give you some figures for me. Uh, I used to say, oh, I, I'm comfortable with a 25% drawdown. You know, I don't. In the past, I have had drawdowns being being up there and a little bit higher than that. I think I had one that was over thirty once. But I say that, but I was also would say most of the time I'm never near that. So most of the time I'm eight percent, ten percent, whatever. But then I get to fifteen percent drawdown, and I'm going, hmm, not really. I'm starting to not feel very good, you know. Mm. And I get to eighteen percent, and I'm starting to squirm. So wherever you set that you say that you think you're comfortable with, you probably find that you're actually not. And uh, so it's a matter of finding where you think you're comfortable is, and, and if you can back that off a little bit, then you know you set yourself up maybe to handle it a bit better. I, I would say broadly speaking, whatever, no, no, I say just across the board, just a, kind of a broad generalization. I think what most people think they can handle what they can actually handle mentally and emotionally is about half that. So if you said, oh, yeah, I could handle a 30% drawdown, well, can you really? <laughs> or, mm. or are you okay with 15? Because if you get it to 25, you get to 26%, right, how is this going to be impacting you? you know? mm, okay. Now, a question on um, how this trading works, because you're based in New Zealand, and it sounds like a lot of the markets that you trade are in the States, which is, you know, when you're probably asleep. So how, how does that work? Do you do you monitor the trade somehow during the night? Well, we've, I've changed over the years. So go back a few years ago, I had a staff. I had two people here in New Zealand that helped me. This is when I was managing client funds because when I was managing client funds, I felt a duty of 
responsibility to these people who I was trading their accounts. So I had uh, the three of us, we traded basically not exactly around the clock, but pretty well almost around the clock. And we'd sort of take shifts. Um, but after I got rid of the CTA and it just so happened that my staff were, one moved on, the other one moved on just before the big PFG thing hit. And I had the brokerage at that time. And so what happened, I did a, the, the, got the brokerage trained up and they were handling the US hours. I was handling the off hours. Um, and But after that, um, I was on my own basically. So it was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? And so I was staying up half the night and I remember saying to my wife, you know, I don't know what I'm doing sitting up here. There's hardly anything ever goes wrong. And the other thing was because I didn't have the complications of trading for other people trading all these different brokers and things. I didn't have the techno some of the technology issues I had and, some of the, and, and became a lot simpler. The other thing is when I got back to doing it all by myself again, I figured out some of the bugs and I got the technology now down so that it's it's very, very reliable. I, I wouldn't say I never have a problem, but I almost have no problems now. So what I do, this probably sounds really terrible, but I just go to bed and I go to sleep and I've got a gigantic smartphone and I just wake up naturally, a bit like if you've got a young baby and you've got the baby monitor, and you wake up and listen to it, and you hear a little snuffle, snuffle. You think, okay, she's all right, baby's fine. Mm. You go back to sleep, and it's like that with my trading because if something goes wrong in the night, like let's say we get a, a some sort of outage, and um, gold does a big move, I could lose a lot of money if I'm on the wrong side of it. So as a precaution, I just wake up naturally um, every so often, check it. I can just with the smartphone, I can lean out over the bed check it without disturbing my wife and if everything's okay i can just go straight back to sleep so it really it's actually really easy to do <laughs> uh, so i guess hypothetically if if there was some type of um big market move like that being a systematic trader would you actually do anything i would only do something if there was something that had gone wrong um, for example if we had a, a day a, 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 the platform had gone down I mean, I sat through flash crash. I don't know if you know what flash crash mm. was. Remember that? Yeah. Um, uh, my staff member was working. He was actually in another office, but we were connected remotely. And he said, if you look at the price of S&P, and I looked over and was like, and my eyes just sort of got <laughs> very, very large mm. because um, it happened so quick that, and we lost, it was a lot of loss on the, on the table. Um, and what happened was that the, the market moved so fast that the technology we were using, I think it just couldn't handle it. Mm. And all the, the, the you know, it, and the thing platform failed. And so we had to restart the platform. Then we had to resynchronize all the clients and, and so forth. Um, but that's, that would be the only thing I, I would do is if there was a, some sort of technical outage that occurred at the same time. But what I'm saying is because the markets can move so much, like you can get Gold moves thirty, forty dollars an ounce, and if I've got a lot of contracts on, that's a lot of money. You know, I mean, you could talk them, you know, yeah, significant, significant amounts of money. So if I was on the wrong side of it, then obviously that could be an issue. And I, I just can't be there for everything, so um, I just check it every so often, just to make, just to, as a precaution, really. I, I find very little goes wrong, but you know, there is from time to time things. You know. Yeah, right. Okay. So um, let's move on to PFG because you've mentioned that you're impacted by the um, the PFG situation. So firstly, can we just start with a little bit of what actually happened and then the impact that that had on you personally and, and trading wise? Yeah, well, the background of that was I, I was with PFG for a number of reasons. That, that was where that World Cup contest was in. So I was trading there. Um, I had clients there and so forth. And I'd met the senior executives of the firm bar the actual um, head head guy. I'd had lunch with them a couple of times. And so, you know, I felt relatively comfortable with the firm. I had was looking at shifting money to other firms, but it was a good firm to deal with. I, I dealt with them for a while. Um, they were good. And then we had, um, they, it was one of the few places you could trade futures and Forex all at one firm. Um, most of them places you've got to have, you know, they're completely different firms and the technology and so forth. So, so I could trade at one place with futures and Forex. Then they, they, they linked the accounts. So it just looked like one account. So, it was good in that respect, but um, what happened was the um, the chairman of the firm um, he, he'd been quite high up, like he'd been a, he'd, he'd been an, an advisory board to the NFA and so forth. Um, he he had committed some huge fraud that had gone on for quite some time, um, and of course he was the controlling the firm. And so what happened was um, basically he'd stolen the client's money, which was in a, what was called a customer segregated account. 
except that instead of being segregated for customers, he took it and bought property and jet planes and all sorts of things. Mm. So uh, just suddenly one day it came out, he tried to commit suicide because it was coming out what he'd done because it was, the NFA decided they wanted electronic ac- access to the bank accounts and things. And he'd been forging documents for years and then forwarding on and it, it looked to, to the, all the regulators like this had come dr- directly from the bank. So anyway, the firm failed immediately. They shut it down that day and we had all our accounts frozen. Um, and it was, you know, it took a long time to get any information. It took about two months, I think, before we finally could sort of get a better picture of what was going on. But the guts of it was, I think after about three months, I got about 17% of the total amount of money oh. I had back um, that I could trade with. There was still other money there, but big questions around it and so forth, you know. So it was a major, major setback, you know. Mm. So what, did you have all your trading funds in PFT at the time? I didn't have all of them there, but I had the majority of them there. So it was a, yeah, it was a big kick in the guts. And then the other thing, which was very difficult, um, I'd been through, just, I'd also been through MEP Global the year before with a small amount of money. But within three or four weeks, we, we had our money. We were trading again. With PFG, there was just no information. It just didn't come out. Every day, you'd be thinking, okay, today they're going to tell us something. And it was it was actually quite hard on me, just not not knowing um, what what was going to happen, and, what, and it just went on and on and on. Um, and then the money we actually got, you finally when they transferred some money to another broker, to another firm, it was I think well, well I know from me, you know, well, at least when I could find the money, I think it was close to three months later. Normally, if a firm went broke, the money should be separate, a bit like a lawyer's trust account, and yeah. the lawyer died or something, you know, the lawyer could just take your, your things over. And that's what's supposed to happen with futures. Um, and it, if all things had been done correctly and the firm itself went broke, then your your funds would just transfer to another firm and you'd carry on. It might be a week delay or something, you know. But this was not like that. So, so that uh, essentially then you you stopped trading because you lost such a large chunk of your funds? Well, for a start off, I didn't have any money in the trading accounts. So I didn't <laughs> have any trading accounts. So I, I, it was kind of, I had some minimal stuff somewhere. Um, and I had, I did trade at a small level, but it was just nuking me out, you know. And so I actually decided just to take a complete break from it because it was, you know, mentally I was getting pretty knocked around, you know. Mm, okay. So um, d- did you ever consider giving up trading completely at some stage? Yeah. I mean, obviously when that happened, it was like, well, what's the point? I mean, I've done, you know, done well, I've made all this money, but now it's all stolen from me. So what's the point sort of thing? And so I did... Um, sort of think, was that it? Am I finished? Sort of thing. Um, and in fact, I came to Australia. I think you probably heard me say, I came to, it probably sounds silly, I lost all this money, so I spent money and went to Australia on holiday because I just needed to, I just needed to get out of it. I just needed yeah. to break from sitting at the computer every day waiting for information. So I took some time out, came over to Australia and just did a bit of a ticky tour. or went walk about, as you would say, <laughs> over there. Um, but a motor home, traveled around and I, I, I sat down and I didn't, I, I just didn't even want to think about business. I just wanted to clear my head, you know? And so when I sort of finished that, I thought, okay, time to deal with this now. And I, I think at that point, I actually didn't, didn't know what was going to happen. I said, well, okay, is that it? You know, am I finished as a trader? Um, and I think for me, one of the big things was I thought, well, there was two things was, well, I have a personal, I've got a vision around my business that, you know, and so I've, that's, I've got this vision and I'm saying, well, hang on, what about my vision? Is that, is that dead? And then the other thing is, um, practically speaking, okay, it wasn't me, wasn't my fault that this happened. This was the, the, the greed and the, the pride and greed and pride of, of one man that actually caused all this. It wasn't because the methods I was using weren't any good. I still had all the tools. I still had all my systems. So I had all that, and so I thought, well, I've had a big knockback, but, you know, the reality is, you know, I've still got my vision, I've still got all my toolbox, if you want to call it that, so I've still got the ability to carry on, and I've actually still had financial resources that I had access to, it's just that they weren't from my trading account, obviously, <laughs> so um, I decided to, no, I did, I still had this vision, I still had everything, and and I, I was comfortable with what I was doing, and so I decided to um, move forward. And so I did a bit of a restructure, and I, I was able to get some additional funds from my friendly neighborhood bank, uh, courtesy of uh, property securities and things, and um, and just re-injected new capital and, uh, and then carried on. 
so what have the results been since then? How's your trading going now? Well, generally, generally it's been fairly good. I'm not quite those, you know, um, returns that I was getting before. I mean, when I talked about like 300% a year, I mean, I did, I think the first year I might have done close to 200%, but it doesn't seem to have done as well over the, you know, the, the, the next year was, well, it was worse in percentage terms, but yet last year was, let's say, our tax year ends on 31st of March here. It was a record profit year. But in percentage terms, it wasn't as good as my previous percentage returns. Because so the amounts are getting larger, but the percent is getting a little lower. So, but you know, so dollars are up, percentages down. Um, this year is being a little bit more difficult. I've seemed to be going up and down, sort of round in circles a bit more, and that's one of the reasons I've just had a reassessment of things and decided to pair back some of the systems I'm using um, because I've, I, I'm questioning if I perhaps my effort to diversify have included systems that maybe we're just too borderline, you know. Mm, okay. So um, so you said you were involved in the uh, the MF Global uh, issue and then PFG. What lessons can you take from experiencing both of those? Well, it's, it's difficult. I mean, basically, if you can't, if you can't have, you don't have any money with these places, you can't trade. But what you can do is two, one, of, one of two things, or you can do them both at the same time, is you can spread your money between multiple firms. That's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is with futures, you, you only require a relatively low margin. So, for example, if you're talking about, uh, let's say, the S&P contract, it's sitting at 2100 or whatever it is, so it's about a $100,000 contract. You only need about, I'm not sure exactly, but it might be four or $5,000 overnight in the account, if you day trade it, you don't need very much at all. So you don't actually need that much in terms of margin in your account to trade. And so what I now do is take all the money that I don't need out. So you know, if you don't need it for margin, if you don't think you're going to need it for margin, you do need to leave enough in so that you know, obviously you don't want margin calls. But um, I just take it out and and let the account trade with the, the notional amount maybe, but take the excess capital that's not required for margin out, so it's not at risk. So if it if you did face that again, you have less money at risk. Yeah, okay, that's a good tip. Thanks for sharing that one. Now, uh, earlier in the interview, you mentioned that you, um, you used to trade Forex, and I think when you won the World Cup Trading Championships in 2011, you were trading both futures and Forex, so... Uh, I think 2011, that, that, that one, I, I was trading both, but in the contest, I traded only Forex. And I think one of the reasons I did, used Forex in that particular thing was because, you know, the, Forex, the World Cup challenge, I mean, you could start with any size account. I mean, you know, there's a minimum of 10000 or something, but you could have started with a million-dollar account or a $100,000 account. But with a smaller account, the Forex gave me the opportunity to very, very accurately money manage it because we could trade right down to 10,000 lots. Yeah. So that gave me very accurate money management, and it was, of course, very aggressive. So that, that 2011 year, that particular account that you're referring to was 4X. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so what type of strategies were you trading during that competition? Um, that was all Euro, US dollar, but it was a mixture of strategies. There was breakouts, there was reversals, there was um, ones that would wait for um, the market to pull back and then it'd carry on. So there's a number of different sort of strategies within that. You know, So even though it was one contract, I diversified my reasons to trade within that one contract. Mm, okay, and you've you've mentioned before that you've moved away from Forex now. What's the reason behind that? Um, I think just well, two things. Firstly, simplicity. Um, secondly, some of the stuff that I was using for Forex just doesn't seem to have been working as well, mainly due to that volatility. So for, for simplicity, rather than having a futures account, a Forex account, and so forth, um, I decided just well I could trade these I could trade the same method but trade it as a euro currency future, so I did that mm. you know just to keep it all in one you know rather than having like I say because again at PFG we could have futures and forex and even they were technically separate accounts they were effectively linked and you could just move money between them and so forth where the other firms it isn't like that so you'd have to have a money at one an FX firm and your money at a forex a futures firm so I just decided to keep it simple and just trade futures you know yeah okay. All right, before we wrap up, I'd just like to ask you a couple of questions on goals. So in your LinkedIn bio, you, when you're talking about the World Cup Trading Championship, you said, I achieved that goal I set for myself and have not entered this year. So can you share how important goals are to your trading success? I, I'm not sure of so much how much goals are, but I think vision is. 
Now, you know, a goal is very specific. You say, oh, I want to make 100% return in the next 12 months or whatever. A vision is often much, much longer term than that. Um, and it's not necessarily stat specific in terms of, you know, I'm going to make 100% return. I'm going to have 10 people work for me or whatever it is. But it's more of a picture that then you, one something you're aiming for, one something, a goal is something you're aiming for, a vision is something you actually see happening. Mm. So that's, that's, that's quite different. Um, a goal you aim for, a vision you see, and so therefore you believe. You, you, it's something you, you see is happening, not something you'd like to happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, you also mentioned that vision was one of the uh, one of the drivers for you moving on from the PFG um, yeah. thing. So it's obviously quite important. Do you mind uh, sharing a little bit about your vision? Well, I don't probably get too specific, but just broadly speaking, I have a vision. It's not actually so much about specifics about the business. It does involve the business. It does involve you know kind of what I see in terms of how not so much financially how big, but you know, they have a small team of people working with me and so forth. But it's more about what I can do through the business. So in my case, I'm a church going guy, Christian guy. So I, a lot of my stuff is certainly being inspired by that aspect of my life. So for me, my vision is around um, what I can do through the business uh, and particularly um, regarding being able to financially resource, uh, not necessarily even uh, church based stuff, but also outside that this year, for example, Something here for the local uh, rescue helicopter service, um, and we've done we've done all sorts of different things over over periods of time. But um, it's it's really about that. It's about about what I can do through the business um, rather than you know, the business itself. That make, that makes sense. Yeah. But what that gives me, it gives me a, 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 a much bigger picture perspective, and it helps me to ride. I think through ups and downs a lot better than if I was didn't have that and that's that's for me now that's my vision but somebody else could have a vision it might be quite different um but it still could be long term like it might involve a family or or something quite different you know but that, that's just my personal you know. okay well thanks for sharing some insights into vision tim that's really um really uh handy so i'd just like to uh, start wrapping this up with a couple of quick closing questions so uh, uh, the first one what's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading well, in the early days, I'd say uh, basically almost anything can happen, especially if you think it won't, it will. That's the early days. Um, that's probably the year. It, and probably the, the other biggest lesson, if you want to put it there, like that, a little bit more realistic, would be learning to do this stuff is viably, consistently ongoing is a, is a really, really tall order. And it's probably going to take you a lot longer than you think. It certainly took me years and years and years of pretty well almost full time at it. So, um, and I didn't. I thought it was going to take a few months. You know. So. Mm. And what's the hardest part of trading? Uh, probably the fact that for the most part you're on your own. You know, it, it, it's, it, it can be. A, you describe it as a lonely business. You, you, you're trading by yourself. It doesn't require anybody else. Here's I got me and my computers. <laughs> <laughs> so from that aspect, it's a very, you know, it's a, yeah, that, that's probably the biggest factor, the biggest negative thing about the business that you don't have the actual real need to have a lot of involvement with people. You, you have a need to be involved with people, but from a business perspective, you don't really. Yeah, okay. Um, what do you think is the most important attribute a trader needs to become successful? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I would say... The ability to um, have very good discipline and consistency about what you do. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favourite website or online resource that you'd like to mention or recommend? I don't really have anything online. Um, I, I do have a book that I read years ago that I've kept and it's getting pretty brown, bit beaten up. I think it was called. I'm just going off memory because I don't know where the book is. I probably lent it to someone. I haven't got it back yet. It was, I think, it was called "Come in My Come Into My Trading Room" by Alexander Elder. Yeah. And the reason I liked that book was when I first read it, I thought, "Oh, what a load of rubbish!" You know, he's talking about all these things, and I was looking for you know ways to trade at that time. But he was a psychologist, and his back that was his background. So he came from all these other angles, and I used to remember reading this stuff. And oh, what a load of rubbish! And then I'd discover I'd come across that circumstance myself. 
talk about getting back at the market, for example. Oh, what a silly idea. And then you get angry and you think, right, I'm going to, and you think, what the heck, that's exactly what he talked about. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of kind of the psychological aspect of it. And a lot of, there was a lot of lessons in there about, you know, he said like there's a lot of money to be made in trading, but most of it wasn't from trading. It was from the services around trading. And at the first, I didn't think that was true. I thought, uh, 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 but then I realized in hindsight, he was right that, that actually most of the money that's made in trading is made by brokers and vendors and all sorts of things. But the actual people that make the money from the trading is, is, is only a minority of the people. You know? Yeah. Okay. And um, if, if listeners wanted to get in touch with you, is there a way they can do that? Um, I don't have any sort of real, I mean, cause I don't run, I don't have a public thing. I don't have a website or anything like that. If they did want to contact me, I guess maybe they could talk to you and yeah, touch sure. me or something like that because yeah, I've got no, I don't have any websites or anything like that anymore because I don't run a business for, I don't even have a business card now. That, that, that. So. <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay. Well, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with us today, Tim. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Um, I don't think so. Just, um, I mean, this business is a very, very difficult business. Most people that set out to do this business do end up losing money. Um, it is a, it's, it, it's a business that you, it, it is able to be done, but it's something that takes a, a lot of time to usually get any good at, and um, and it's got a, yeah, there's an awful lot of pitfalls in it as well. So, uh, but that's why I say, you know, consistency, discipline, those sort of things that are very, very critical aspects of. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks for spending time with us today, Tim, and being so yeah. willing to share with us. Um, I wish you all the best for the future, and yeah, thanks for your time. That's good. Cheers. Thanks, Tim, for spending time with us this week. Here are two of my favorite insights from the chat with Tim. We often hear about the importance of diversification, but I've never heard anyone take it to the extremes Tim has, trading more than 100 strategies over 25 futures contracts. The benefits of that is that he can trade much more aggressively with a portfolio of strategies than if he had just a, an individual strategy. He also mentioned that diversification doesn't have to be across instruments or markets. He won the World Cup Trading Championship trading just the Euro-US dollar pair in Forex by diversifying strategies and timeframes. Tim's experience with the MF Global and PFG collapses is a great reminder of the risk of our trading accounts sitting with brokers or other institutions. There's been a number of collapses around the world in recent years, both big and small companies, and even though client funds should be segregated, how do we know they really are? Tim's suggestions were to spread your trading capital amongst brokers and to only keep enough money in your account to operate. If you want to get more information about this episode, head over to the show notes, bettersystemtrader.com slash 21. We have links to additional content. Plus, as I mentioned before the interview, we have a huge giveaway to celebrate reaching episode 20 of the podcast last week. The main prize is an entire year's worth of trading books. Plus, we also have a bunch of smaller prizes too. All the books in the prize pool are by previous guests of the show. So if you don't have their books yet, here's your chance to pick them up for free. The giveaway ends August 30th, so head over to the show notes page on the website right now, bettersystemtrader.com slash 21, where you can find more details on the prizes and, of course, how you can enter. In this week's episode, our guest is the founder of a prop trading firm that specializes in algorithmic trading. He shares some interesting insights into prop trading and arbitrage, so don't miss that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the chat with Tim Ray this week. Thanks for listening to Better System Trader. Don't forget to sign up to the book giveaway if you haven't already. And I'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader. Better System Trader.